Welcome to this version of Zoom with ZOA. Uh, the program today is entitled Hama Israel Hamas Hostages War Update and Insight into Issues with the Biden Administration. Our guest is a very good friend of ZOA, Brigadier General and Reserve Amir Avivi. We'll have a proper introduction to General Avivi in just a moment. I'm Alan Jay, National Executive Director here at ZOA. Thank you for joining us for this timely and vitally important program. <laughs> All microphones will remain muted for the duration of the program. Time permitting, there will be some Q&A at the end. But as I said earlier, General Avivi does have a hard stop at approximately 12.45. Uh, we will not be monitoring the chat feature, so please do not use the chat feature. All questions must be submitted in the Zoom Q&A feature. Please don't be offended if your question is not picked up, because we will have limited time. Uh, out of respect, again, for the General's time, I won't spend a lot of time telling you what you already know about ZOA. I will tell you that it seems like now more than ever, ZOA finds ourselves <clears throat> largely alone advocating for Israel's legal, historical, and biblical rights and the ability for her to defend herself. And even as today's webinar will point out, in the arena of strenuously challenging the current administration's strategies that seem to favor Israel's enemies. ZOA continues to fight in the courts on college campuses and in the halls of Congress. I would like to point out that ZOA National President Mort Klein was quoted in the Wall Street Journal this morning. Uh, you'll see an email with a link to that article a little bit later. And uh, Mr. Klein will be speaking this coming Sunday at the Chabad of the Upper East Side of Manhattan. There's limited seating. If you'd like to join us, please email me directly. Jackie, please put my email address in the, uh, in the chat. Uh, and I will respond to you appropriately. Okay. Mort and Rita Klein and ZOA National Board Chair Ruben Margulis are hosting a very important leadership mission to Israel between June 2nd and June 6th. It's open to ZOA Brandeis Donor Society members and up. So if you already donate at least $5,000 per year to ZOA or you can, you are eligible. So please email me again and I'll get you all the details. ZOA advocacy needs to grow. So I do ask that you continue to support ZOA as generously as you can. Here to introduce our very special guest, ZOA National Board Vice Chair, Michael Orbach. Hello, everybody. Welcome to this edition of the ZOA webinar series, where we share important information and updates with our supporters. Today, I am very pleased to introduce you to our featured speaker, who is doing very important work, both in Israel and overseas, he is a good friend and an important partner of the ZOA and an inspiration to us all. Brigadier General Reserve Amir Avivi is the founder and chairman of the IDSF, the Israel Defense and Security Forum, Habit Khonistim. He retired from the IDF after 30 years in 2017 with extensive national defense experience, including holding the positions as the director of the Office of the Chief of Staff the Deputy Controller of Security Forces, Commander of the School of Combat Engineering, among others. After his service, he founded the IDSF in 2020, together with other high-ranking officers, which has now grown into a grassroots movement of almost 30,000 people, including reserve officers from the IDF, the Shin Bet, the Mossad, and civilians throughout Israeli society. The IDSF mission is to promote a clear vision of Israel's national security needs and includes government briefings, research, education, and many public appearances. Those of us who were on the ZOA mission last year were fortunate to have him show us some important strategic areas around Israel and to hear his briefings. We all look forward to his insight and important updates from the ground in Israel. And now, General Amir Avivi. Michael, thank you very much. Uh, I want to thank also Mort uh, for uh, reaching out to do this uh, briefing. I'm always happy and honored to, to brief the ZOA, really the most Zionistic organization, uh, Jewish organization in the USA, uh, for Alan to, for uh, facilitating this. Um, I want to start by uh, explaining what's going on in Gaza uh, at the moment. The, the overall picture is uh, that uh, the Israeli Defense Forces, you know, they've taken uh, over the whole northern part of Gaza. 
and they have control of this area. Uh, there were many terrorists scattered in different places in the north of Gaza, but in many areas in the north, there is nobody, no civilians, and uh, there is no electricity or water. So basically, all the Palestinians and the terrorists, um, they went to the area of Shifa and the surroundings of Shifa, around 200,000 people, because this is the only place where there is electricity and water and also the humanitarian aid is arriving to this uh, area. And the uh, remaining terrorists, they thought they will uh, find the serum inside the Shifa hospital, thinking that the IDF is not going to operate anymore inside the hospital. So they started going into the hospital. The IDF had intelligence. They waited until uh, the vast majority went into the hospital. And then in 15 minutes, they crossed the whole area of Gaza, surrounded the hospital, and started operating inside, uh, killing 200 uh, ter uh, terrorists and uh, apprehending almost 500. Very successful and big uh, operation. And this shows uh, how much Israeli Defense Forces control the northern part uh, of Gaza, which we have completely isolated from the other parts. And we're encouraging uh, the society to continue to move south uh, of, the, of the northern part of Gaza. The overall policy is we're not letting people back if we don't get back the hostages and, and Hamas doesn't surrender. Um, so this is one of the really uh, tools Israel has to push and pressure and uh, try to get the hostages released and uh, also encourage the society to go against Hamas. Um, we are operating in the central camps of uh, Gaza all the time, but half of them are in our control and half there are still two Hamas battalions, which we haven't really touched seriously yet. Uh, only from the air, we haven't done a ground incursion in the area of the El Balach. Uh, so we're not controlling the central camps to the extent we are controlling the northern part. The southern part of uh, Gaza, uh, I talk about three distinct areas. One is Khan Yunus, the other one is the coastal area where Gush Katif was, and Rafah. The Hamas uh, brigade in Khan Yunus was destroyed. There are scattered terrorists in different places uh, in Khan Yunus and the army is um, cleaning the area and dealing with neighborhoods where we know there are still uh, terrorists uh, like El Amal. Um, but overall, uh, we are controlling uh, Khan Yunus. The area is, of Gush Katif was designated to um, the Palestinian civilians to go there. This is like the area that are safe. And we suppose that there are probably also quite a few uh, terrorists there. And then there is uh, Rafah. In Rafah, there is a whole brigade, four battalions. Uh, all the leadership of Hamas uh, withdrew to Rafah. They took the hostages with them. Uh, one of the things that people don't understand. They see the IDF taking more and more areas in, in Gaza and nothing happens. We don't find the leadership of Hamas and also not the, the hostages. And the reason is simple. Each place the uh, IDF goes into, the Hamas retreats from this area to the next place. But that's it. The last place is Rafah. There, uh, Hamas is uh, with their back to the wall. Literally, there is a wall there that uh, uh, the Egyptians built on the border. And therefore, Rafah will not look anything like uh, all the other ground incursions and operations of the IDF. In Rafah, we will destroy Hamas as a governmental and military entity. And also in Rafah, this is where the hostages are. We are hoping they didn't manage to uh, take any hostages to Egypt and beyond. But as far as we know, uh, they are in Rafah, and this is why it's so mm -hmm. crucial uh, to go in and do the job. And I think this is also why there is a lot of pressure on Israel not to go into Rafah. 
This is from people who don't want Israel to win. So now, uh, overall, there is an attempt to portray Rafah like an impossible place. And what will we do with all these million people in Rafah? Well, where will we move them? And I, I want to remind that we moved a million people 30 miles from Gaza City all the way to the south. Now we have to move them maybe three miles, not 30. And it's not that complicated. I can tell you, I've sat with the officers that are planning um, how to move uh, the Palestinians and the IDF has ready, the plans, the plans are ready to uh, to move them to the coastal area or to the area of Khan Yunus or both of them. And also the IDF is ready for a ground incursion in, a, in a Rafah. And now uh, we are waiting for a, for a green light uh, from the cabinet. And this, they are the discussions that are being held uh, with the, the US. And uh, I was very uh, disturbed and sorry to hear the comments of the uh, Vice President uh, Kamala Harris um, not encouraging Israel to go into Rafah and Saying to Israel, don't go to Rafah, is basically saying to Israel, lose the war. Saying to Israel, don't do in, in Rafah what you did in Khan Yunus or in Gaza, is also uh, basically uh, saying to us, uh, um, don't be effective in <clears throat> conducting. There is no way to find the hostages or the leadership of Hamas without being very systematic, as we were in Khan Yunus, going into the tunnels really step by step and reaching the headquarters and reaching the, the underground infrastructure, finding the leadership of Hamas and the hostages. This requires a ground incursion. This requires an attack uh, on, on Rafah as we did in, uh, in Khan Yunus. Without that, we cannot achieve the goals of war. Right. Um, and also, the fact that we are not doing that yet, this has implications also in the north because the overall strategy of Israel is first finish uh, the missions in, in Gaza, destroy Hamas, and then deal with Hezbollah. And uh, this is important because um, the only chance, and it's a very small chance, but the only chance to really maybe get a diplomatic solution in the north and get Hezbollah to withdraw from South Lebanon is destroying Hamas. This might send a strong message to Hezbollah saying you're next and you better withdraw and enable Israel to bring back the citizens to their homes. All these tens of thousands displaced Israelis from their towns in the north. Uh, without that, the chances of reaching a, an agreement that they will make Hezbollah withdraw are very small. And even then, if there is no American leadership, if America doesn't build a coalition, if we don't pose a credible military threat on Iran and deal with Iran, the chances of solving the issue in Lebanon are very small. And, and this means that the most probable scenario at the moment is a full-scale war in Lebanon. It means that the IDF will have to conduct a very, very large ground incursion into Lebanon, destroy Hezbollah in South Lebanon, deal with the long-range missiles and rockets and the drones and all these capabilities that um, Hezbollah has built for, for many, many years. And maybe um, everything that happened until now is just the promo to a much bigger war. Uh, with Hezbollah, and probably this is the case. Uh, maybe not as long a war like we're experiencing in Gaza, but definitely a very intensive one. And this is something that um, we need to take in account. Israel at the moment is dealing with seven different fronts. We have uh, Gaza as our main uh, place where we are operating at the moment, uh, Hezbollah, Lebanon, of course, uh, we're dealing uh, with uh, the Palestinians in Judea and Samaria, the Arab Palestinians. Uh, but we, uh, this is three 
areas, but we also have the militias in Syria and Iran that is uh, trying to weaponize Hezbollah and, and its militias in Syria. We saw the attack uh, the IDF conducted uh, this week uh, near the Iranian embassy, uh, which was a very successful uh, attack. Um, but we have quite a few militias in Syria uh, and also Hezbollah endangering Israel also from the Golan Heights. Uh, we saw this week a drone that was sent from the Iraqi militias. We see missiles being shot from Yemen, from the Houthis, in, uh, towards uh, Elat. And well, of course we have Iran itself. And this is even without talking about Israeli Arabs, which until now are fairly quiet. Uh, we had one terror attack of a Bedouin in the south, uh, but overall uh, the Israeli Arab society till now is, uh, is uh, pretty quiet. Um, I think that uh, having such really difficult, terrible war with, with a massacre like we experienced on the 7th of October Really, we would have expected to see the Western world and, and the U.S. really fully supporting the state of Israel and our right to defend ourselves uh, the best way possible. And, and we see this is happening not like we would have expected. On one hand, <laughs> yes, we are getting weapons and yes, uh, we are getting munitions. Uh, but on the other hand, um, I can say that our enemies, Hezbollah, Iran, Hamas, are very much empowered by why they are hearing uh, from the administration, sometimes also from the State Department, or from the UN. Uh, and this uh, is very problematic because at the end of the day, this war is not a local war, it's a global war. It's a global war between pure evil and extremism devoted to the destruction of Western society. Uh, and Israel at the forefront of a war really defending the whole West. And this is coming for everybody. Uh, so really when we talk and we have extensive meetings with the European Union and Washington, we really try to convey this message uh, that Supporting Israel is basically supporting the defense of the whole Western uh, society. And uh, we expect really all countries to, to support Israel. And unfortunately, it's not happening the way we expect it to happen. Um, Alan, I'd be happy. You know, I'm sure uh, you guys have a lot of questions and are happy to, you know, address them. <laughs> That's great. First of all, Amir, thank you for the succinct and and informative review. I'm going to throw the uh, I'm going to throw the mic over to Mort for the first question or two. Thank you, thank you, General Avivi, <clears throat> for updating us as to uh, the difficult situation, the important critical situation in Gaza. <laughs> I've been told that Israel has <clears throat> demanded or requested certain arms that America refuses to give. So first of all, is that true, that Israel's not getting all the types of weapons they want? And secondly, I have to ask you politically, why do you, General Avivi, think that America is helping Hamas, demanding we not go into Rafah, which, as you said, means we will not destroy Hamas, <laughs> claiming this deep concern for Gaza civilians, 85% of whom support Hamas and October 7th. So I don't believe they really care about Gaza civilians. They didn't care about civilians in Iraq or Afghanistan or Somalia or in the, in the Saudi Ye Yemen war. What do you think is the real reason that this administration in America, of which I'm a citizen, is making it, trying desperately to stop Israel from destroying Hamas? What is the real reason, in your opinion? Well, it's only maybe my assessment and private opinion because it's not my area of expertise. Um, but but I think that, you know, um, the U.S. is entering a years of election. And uh, I think that this is affecting dramatically 
um, uh, the way this is handled, because at the end, at the end of the day, I think that uh, with all due respect to this small area, you know, Israel, Gaza, which is really not that important for the US overall, uh, I think elections are very important for them. And uh, the question is, what messaging will support re-election um, in November? And I think that overall, there is like some kind of attempt to find the balance between the real need to support Israel. And supporting Israel is not only really a critical uh, interest of US national security. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, in order to really um, balance the situation in the Middle East. But also we have to remember that the whole Middle East is looking at the US and how it supports or not supports Israel. And if the US doesn't stand with Israel strongly, uh, this will convey a message globally and regionally um, <laughs> that the US is not necessarily a strong partner now we see it with Saudi Arabia and with Egypt. We see Egypt in the last decade procuring more and more weapons from Russia. We see Egypt joining BRICS, the economical ecosystem of the East and South, and also Saudi Arabia joining BRICS. We see Saudi Arabia renewing relations with Iran. Uh, we see the close relationship between Saudi Arabia and China. Um, they are all contemplating uh, on which side to be, and because the world is again starting to look divided between east and west, and west um, every country is thinking, okay, what side we want to be? On the Chinese, Russian, Iranian side, or on the western side? And the west needs to show that it treats its allies seriously. And they are strong allies. Um, but at the same time, I think that the, the US uh, administration is thinking about, um, I would say, more the more progressive part of the Democratic Party and about Muslims who live in the US. And they're trying to appease them and, and, and send a clear message that they are uh, very worried about uh, the Palestinian citizens and they want to make sure that they get humanitarian aid and that they are evacuated properly from Rafah and so on. Um, I'm not sure that the administration is against going into Rafah, but the way the messages are being uh, talked on, on media and in interviews, this is empowering Hamas a lot. And it's also endangering the hostages because if Hamas feels that time is working for them and not against them, they are less willing to release hostages. And the fact that the US abstained in the UN Council in a resolution that disconnected between a ceasefire and releasement of hostages, this is a message that empowers our enemies a lot. <laughs> and also, uh, uh, the question, is Israel getting all the arms it is requiring of the United States, and is it getting the arms in a, a quick and appropriate manner? So we're getting a lot of assistance, uh, but even the chief of staff of the U.S. said that they're not giving us everything. Um, so I, I cannot say that we got 100% of what we wanted, but I can say that we got a lot of assistance and without the US uh, supporting uh, the war, it would have been much, much more difficult. But I think that the lesson really for Israel, and it's a lesson Israel should have learned a long time ago. When it comes to munitions, we cannot rely on anybody. We need to be able to produce our own munitions and we need much, much, much bigger stockpiles of munitions to begin with when we start a war. And, and I've been talking about that for a long time. In the time I was in the army, I think the IDF 
always prefer to invest more money in new technologies instead of readiness, and it's a huge mistake. Um, and now we're paying for this, and we'll have to change. We'll have to build our military industries in a way that can fully support Israeli wars. Mort, I'm going to ask a couple of questions from the floor, if that's okay. Yes, go ahead. Uh, great. But before I do, I just want to remind our audience that ZOA is a 501c3, and we neither endorse nor promote any political candidates or parties. So if the conversation goes in a direction, understand that ZOA is a policy-driven organization, and that's our focus. Um, Amir, we have a question from uh, the ZOA president of the Michigan chapter, Sheldon Freilich, and it's a little bit difficult maybe for you to answer, but of course, he, you, you may remember Sheldon, he traveled with us last time we were in Israel. He, he thanks you, of course, for your dedication, but then asks, you know, your insights are so clear and your analysis is so strong. He asks if you have audience with those who are making decisions, like, is your, are you being listened to? Are you heard? Since the beginning of the war, uh, we had um, many meetings with the prime minister. I think that in every single decision the Prime Minister of Israel made, he consulted with us. Um, we're meeting regularly also with the Minister of Defense. Um, we are dominating in national TV in Israel. And uh, we're getting a lot, a lot of uh, uh, time on TV on an everyday basis. Um, we have grown during the war to 30,000 members and growing every week. So many people are realizing that um, we were right. We, we we saw the war coming. We wrote about that. And so, yes, today people listen to us uh, uh, much more. And we're also very active uh, now in Washington and the European Union. We brief the diplomats in Israel every week. And... Um, and we get feedbacks. I can say that if um, we write something that um, one embassy is upset about, we immediately get a feedback. Um, and uh, so they're very much listening to, to what we are saying. Um, and I'm happy that there is this voice which was very much lacking from uh, the discussion before, before we had only generals promoting retreats, concessions, and uh, seeing more the Palestinian side than, than our side. This is not the case anymore. Thank you. Um, from a very good friend to you, I have believed we prefers to remain anonymous. He says there's been a variety of Palestinian construction projects on the periphery of Judea and Samaria. And he'd like to know what are the strategic implications? Is that not a grand cover to mount a much larger assault against the Jews who live there? It's a very big danger, and it's not only in Judea and Samaria, it's in the Negev, it's in the Galilee. And um, I feel that Israel is not treating this properly, just as they didn't treat Gaza or Lebanon properly. And since the beginning of the war, this illegal construction only enhanced. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, a, it's a big danger to Israel. It's a strategic danger. Uh, the problem is that unlike uh, rockets that explode or a massacre like we saw on the 7th of October, um, it started to get the government to wake up. Uh, I think that all governments, including uh, this one, uh, don't really have a clear vision of what is really our goals, our red lines. Without them, they are not treating seriously this uh, issue. It's something that needs to change, and we're working very hard to really get the understanding how dangerous it is. I can tell you that before the war, I, I released my, uh, my book in Hebrew uh, that really foresees the war and talks about all these issues. And I talk at length about the illegal construction. And uh, this, the book will be released also in English in the coming months. That, that's great. I just want to. I just want to inform our audience that this is an issue that ZOA is extremely concerned with and we focus on. And uh, most times that we travel to Israel, we do uh, get toured through the area by a group called Rigavim, who shows us all of this illegal construction. Uh, and we continue to advocate here on the U.S. side for this to stop. 
Um, General, I'm going to ask you a question in a minute that might lead you into a little bit of a longer answer. So first, I'll start with this. When you use the word Palestinians, you're referring to Muslim Arabs of Gaza, Judea, Samaria. But when the others use the word Palestinians, they include Muslim Arabs who are Israeli citizens. How do the Israeli Arab citizens view themselves as Palestinians or as Israelis? Depends who you ask. There is not one uh, one answer. Some of them view themselves as Palestinians. Uh, some of them view themselves as Israeli Arabs. Some of them say they are both. Um, um, so as citizens, they are Israeli citizens. As a nationality, they, they feel many of them part of the Palestinians. And this is because we are enabling them to get Palestinian education. And this brings us to really one thing that we're not dealing properly anywhere. And maybe in Gaza, we should start dealing with is how do you deal with the education, the radicalization of the society? And, and by the way, you cannot deal with that without Israel taking control of Gaza after the war and managing this just as the Marshall Plan was managed. Uh, after the Second World War, uh, the U.S. posed four years of military control on Germany. They did the Marshall Plan, they controlled it, they managed it. Um, and I think that uh, this is something that we in IDSF are not in agreement with the army. The army really doesn't want to take responsibility of the civil side in Gaza. We think it's a great mistake. We're not saying we need to control Gaza uh, forever civically, but definitely if you want to uh, de-radicalize the, the society, if you want to start looking at local leadership that will be instead of Hamas and also Islamic Jihad and Palestinian Authority, we need a different alternative, maybe based on the clans. Um, and you cannot really do that without first taking responsibility of what's going on there. And mil military-wise, we'll have to really control Gaza from now and forever, I think, control the Egyptian border and full freedom of operation for the IDF everywhere, just like we have in Judea, in Judea and uh, Samaria. I'm going to ask one more question before I... I'll pass it back to Mort to close. Uh, does Michael uh, have a question? Oh, I, Michael? Do you hear me? Yes. Yeah, my question has to do with the um, the upcoming operation into Rafa. Uh, how, how is the the uh, the the media the fact that the hostage the um, the hostages and the, and, the, and the parents of the hostages and the families of the hostages that are in the media in Israel. How is this affecting uh, the uh, the situation in terms of uh, getting going into Rafa in the future? Well, um, there is no one um, way of thinking of the hostages' uh, families. You have a group, certain group, not so big, that now decided to really go against the government and demand now to get the hostages and completely ignore the goals of war and the, the soldiers that are fighting and so on. And they are uh, participating in the demonstrations which started now against the government in order to bring down the government. There are many, many other families who think otherwise who support going into Rafah, who understand that this is needed. Now, let's remember that many, many of the remaining hostages are soldiers, and nobody is really talking about them. And, and, and the families of the soldiers know that the only way to release them is military. It's going in and reaching them and releasing them. So there are many, many fa families that are supportive of the ground operation in uh, Rafah. And overall, I can say we 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 uh, um, really did did an in depth check talking about the society, what they think. The vast majority of Israelis uh, support going into Rafah and winning the war, and understand the connection between 
military pressure and releasing the hostages. Okay. All right, Mort, I'm just gonna ask one more question and then we'll have, uh, you'll, you'll close or ask uh, General to close. General Vivi, can you talk for a minute? You know, we, we know that there's the war in, Ham in Gaza and Hamas. We know about Hezbollah in the north. There's a school of thought that we need to address the head of the snake in Iran. And that's a question that we grapple with here in the States. Can you speak to that just a little bit about what Israel's attitude is toward either destroying a couple of the oil fields or even going after their nuclear capability, nuclear weapon capability? Yeah, I think that the Iranians are doing something very smart. They're keeping everybody busy with the their uh, proxies with all these militias while they are moving fast towards nuclear capabilities. And if they reach nuclear capabilities, the whole globe will change. Everybody will be terrorized, the whole world. And uh, we definitely uh, need to push towards a coalition that will deal militarily with Iran. <clears throat> um, this is why I think that Really, the upcoming elections in the U.S. are crucial. Uh, we really, really need an administration that will support a military uh, operation against Iran uh, to deal with their uh, nuclear sites and maybe leadership and uh, oil fields, Navy, whatever this coalition will decide to do. But Israel also needs to be get, get ready to do it uh, alone if needed. We cannot have a nuclear Iran, and we must not lose sight of this uh, really existential threat. It's more dangerous than any other threat we have. All right. More with that, General has about five more minutes. Do you want to have some closing thoughts? <laughs> well, uh, yeah, I, I guess I. It, it's sort of after the fact. I don't understand why Israel has not destroyed the missiles that Hamas has and that Hezbollah has over all these years. How does Israel allow 150,000 missiles to be controlled by Hamas and another 150 or 175 by Hezbollah? Why did we not go in and, and uh, destroy them? Well, uh, I mean, in all the operations, uh, the idea of it in Gaza, we tried. It's impossible to do it without conquering on the ground, the area. The way they build this, uh, there are thousands of sites, all of them that are underground. Even when you are inside, you can stand on one of these uh, rocket launchers and not know that you are standing on them. It happened to us, by the way. Um, the only way to really deal with this is being inside. So if Israel now deciding to go to a full-scale war, it's a tough decision. We said to the government two years ago, look, war is imminent. You have two choices, either six-day war scenario or Yom Kippur war scenario. We need to choose. It's hard to choose being proactive and starting a war. And, and, you, and, and look what's going on. We are in a war after we were massacred. Nothing like anything we saw since the Holocaust and how hard it is to get international support for that. How much support we would have gotten if we if we started the war, if we launched a surprise attack. And, and not only by the way, international support, also internal support in Israel. I don't think that, especially talking about Netanyahu and how uh, divisive things are when it comes to him, how much support from the Israeli society he would have to send the whole country to a war that he initiates. Uh, I, I think that there was no real um, political possibility to do it. It's sad to say so, but this is the, the reality. Well, thank you, General. Thank you so much for your time and your insights during this very difficult time. We at the ZOA, of course, supports what Israel is doing fully and completely. 
we're the only organization that unequivocally condemned Schumer for his outrageous statements about the having elections and getting rid of the prime minister of Israel. We're the only one who condemned Schumer unequivocally. We're the only organization who condemned the Biden administration for not vetoing that horrible UN resolution that called for an, a unilateral, un, unconditional uh, uh, end of the war. It was unbelievable. And I don't know of any other organization that condemned it, which is just shocking to me. <laughs> we, of course, did. Uh, we've always been at the forefront of fighting for what's best for U.S.'s relations, for what's best for Israel and the United States. Uh, as mentioned before, we're quoted in today's Wall Street Journal. Last week in the front page of the New York Times, there was a major story extensively quoting uh, Zioi's extraordinary work headed by Susan Tuckman to change Title VI to cover Jews. We have now filed uh, large numbers of Title VI cases. Without our work, nobody could file Title VI cases to defend Jews. That's the work we did. There was a big article in the New York Times last week about that. We were intimately involved with Senator Kyle to move the embassy to Jerusalem. We were the only organization at the uh, in the beginning and, and in the middle uh, that was fighting for this. We got rid of six anti-Israel nominees uh, in various administrations. We defeated them and got rid of them. Now we are fighting against a terrible nominee, Adil Manji, M-A-N-G-I. Uh, he's a he's a man who has uh, uh, shown sympathy uh, to those who hate Israel and Jews. He sh he dare not become a federal judge. I urge you all of you to write to your senators to vote against Manji. <laughs> I might argue that ADL and AJ committee and other Jewish groups have supported him. It's a shocking outrage. This is a very bad man, hostile to to Israel and to the Jewish people. <laughs> uh. uh and uh, uh, and again, I reiterate uh, to uh, sign up for our trip to Israel. It's the most extraordinary trip. We go everywhere. We go into Judea and Samaria. We have the greatest journalists and members of uh, uh, Knesset and leaders speaking to us. <laughs> and uh, uh, so thank you. Please support us. Go to ZOA.org. Become a member. Strengthen us so our word will be even stronger than it already is. And we are fighting as hard as we can for all the Jewish people and uh, the Jewish state of Israel. So again, I thank all of you for being with us. I thank the general for being with us. Thank you, Michael, for your uh, important words of introduction and Alan. And uh, 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 I'll, I'll really add by saying, <laughs> I think what America is doing with respect to Israel uh, is sinister, not political. They have enormous hostility, this administration, uh, to Israel. Every single appointment that Biden has made that affects Israel is someone hostile to Israel and a friend of Obama's. That's a fact. So I think there's more going on than simply uh, pragmatic politics. Thank you so much. Uh, if anyone were to talk to me or anyone else, call the office and I'll be happy to speak to as many people as I can. Have a great day. Thank you very much, Mark.